Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome everyone. This is the last and final lecture of our course, the second part of Biogeochemical Cycles. This is lecture 63 of module 12. So in this particular uh, part, we are going to cover the sulfur cycle, phosphorus, iron, mercury and one industrial application where we are going to look at how uh, copper can be recovered by a series of chemical and biological reactions. So it's not a natural biogeochemical cycle but it's a sort of imitation at the industrial level of the same kind of ideas. Let's take a look at the sulfur cycle. So what is the global um, understanding of where sulfur comes and goes from? So let us take a look at sulfur emissions from waterlogged soils and lake sediments. Now these are mainly in the form of hydrogen sulfide and dimethyl sulfide. You're all familiar with the stench of sulfide or ammonia. This is very common with wastewater. If you happen to go by the seaside and you have, we normally, at least in common language, we call it this fishy smell that you um, get during, um, in any sea environment, seaside environment. Uh, that is mainly because of these sulfur, sulfurous compounds. It's the sulfurous compounds that are, um, they have a stinky smell and no one really likes it, but they're all forms of sulfide. Okay, so the mercaptans, sulfides, these are the ones that no one really likes and that's what the smell is all about. So these are emissions of sulfide compounds, dimethyl sulfide, hydrogen sulfide, that come into the atmosphere from the waterlogged soils and sediments and that is part of the decomposition process. So when I talk about dead biomass being converted back to mineral form, whether it's CO2 and water, so when I use glucose as an example that does not account for nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus and so on. So that is the missing point over here. So you have sulfur as well in the biomass which is returned to the atmosphere in the form of this reduced form of sulfur. You also have artificial emissions. Artificial means anthropogenic emissions mainly in the form of SO2, sulfur dioxide. Then you have whatever goes into the atmosphere is going to come back into the either terrestrial or aquatic environment. And we use two words, dry deposition and wet deposition. So dry deposition is when the sulfur uh, containing aerosols you might say are absorbing to particles and then the particles come down. They can come down in two ways, either by the weight of the particles or when there is rain or uh, hail or snow or whatever it is, any form of precipitation. If it brings these particles or aerosols down, then it becomes wet deposition. So you have dry and wet deposition. Most of this is in the form of sulfate because by now sulfur has been converted to its most oxidized form which is sulfate. Now this is dry and dep uh, wet deposition over land. The same thing happens over the oceans as well. Um, you also get certain amount of emissions from volcanoes. That's a natural source and um, there is a lot of soluble sulfur that goes into rivers and streams which is then carried to the oceans. Now the ocean spray, again that smelly uh, stench of sulfur, that's the sea spray. Okay, so that sea spray contains sulfur and that sends it back into the atmosphere. So you have emissions from biological decay, mainly hydrogen sulfide, dimethyl sulfide, all of that. So whatever is happening on land is also happening on sea, on the oceans and that is the complete cycle. 
here are examples of individual bacterial species that are responsible for mediating the redox reactions, the oxidation reduction reactions where you get the conversion of sulfur from one oxid, um, oxidation state to another oxidation state. So let's take a look at the most reduced form of sulfur. <clears throat> So the most reduced form of sulfur is hydrogen sulfide, so you have H2S. It then gets converted to either elemental sulfur in both oxic as well as anoxic environments. This elemental sulfur is further oxidized to sulfate. So H2SO4, which is familiar to all of you, is one form of sulfate, but there are several other forms. Now, in nature, these reactions are all mediated by specific species of bacteria. So you have the first one sulfide or sulfur oxidation. So whether it's aerobic or anaerobic. So let's take a look at the anaerobic. Uh, let's go with oxic first. H2S chemolithotrophic oxidation is done by sulfur chemolithotrophs like thiobacillus, pegiatoia and pegiatoia and many other species. Under anaerobic conditions the same reactions are uh, mediated by purple and green phototrophic bacteria as well as chemolithotrophs. Then you have sulfate reduction under anaerobic conditions, sulfate to sulfide. So you have sulfate going back to sulfide and that sulfate reduction by anaerobic bacteria like desulfovibrio and desulfobacter. That was sulfate reduction. Here we have elemental sulfur being converted to hydrogen sulfide, desulfuromonas and many other hyperthermophilic archaea bacteria. Sulfur disproportionation thiosulfate can be converted to two forms, sulfate and sulfide. Now here we have a similar situation like the fermentation of organic compounds where you get a reduced form and an oxidized form. So thiosulfate has an oxidation state that is somewhere between H2S and sulfate. So this thiosulfate is getting partly reduced and partly oxidized and desulfovibrio is the mediating species. You can also have organic sulfur compound oxidation or reduction. So you have sulfur in certain amino acids like cysteine that can be converted to CO2 and sulfide. You have DMSO, dimethyl sulfate, uh, sulfur oxide, which can be converted to dimethyl sulfide. Then desulfurylation, organic sulfur is converted directly to hydrogen sulfide and several organisms are involved in it. Um, wastewater is a very good example of many of these reactions. It has many of these species. And depending on how much oxygen there is in the water, you will get many of these reactions. Municipal wastewater is what I'm talking about. So in a nutshell, this is how sulfur is recycled through nature by nature. So H2S, elemental sulfur, sulfate, back to elemental sulfur and then back to hydrogen sulfide. So you have sulfur oxidation, uh, oxidation reactions, you have sulfur reduction, you have dissimilatory as well as assimilatory uh, sulfur reactions, you have organic sulfur, you have phototrophic oxidation of elemental sulfur and you have sulfur respiration. So the number of processes that are present in nature that allow sulfur to be recycled through all these different parts is any, I mean, the diversity of bacterial species is enormous. Let's then come to the next essential macronutrient and that is phosphorus. Phosphorus in general does not change its oxidation state. Unlike all the other elements, if you notice carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, all of them, the biogeochemical cycles are dependent on the uh, change in oxidation state and that change in oxidation state is entirely due to uh, different species. Different bacterial species are capable of mediating these oxidation reduction reactions. Now phosphorus is very strange, it's very stable. The phosphate part of any compound 
is the most oxidized form of phosphate, uh, phosphorus and therefore it's extremely stable and very few other oxidation um, states have ever been observed. So in terms of the biogeochemical cycles, most of the phosphorus is in the feces of seabirds and for some reason seabirds have very high phosphate content in their fecal matter and that's what the guano deposits are all about. So these guano deposits have been mined and that's how we get our phosphate fertilizer and we get phosphate in the environment by the dissolution of these deposits. This phosphorus which is taken up by plants and then is eaten, these plants are eaten by animals, both types of biomass is going to die and decompose and the decomposing organisms which include bacteria, fungi and so on will bring organic phosphate back into soluble form and some of it will end up in the rocks and some of it and if it's in the rocks it will also be weathered and dissolved and brought back into the water so that cycling of phosphorus from different parts of the environment will always be there and the same thing whatever I said about the land area will also be happening in the aquatic systems. So that's how phosphorus is recycled in both parts, whether it's a lithosphere or the hydrosphere. In both parts, it's more or less the same. There is no oxidation reduction reaction, except one bacterial species that has been observed and is noted in the text. And I think I've covered it in the previous lecture. There is one bacterial species it's a sulfate reducing bacterium that can couple phosphite. Phosphite is a reduced form of phosphorus and it can couple phosphite oxidation to sulfate reduction, thus recycling both sulfur and phosphorus. Let's now come to another element. The next element is iron. Iron is not a macronutrient, it's a micronutrient, but it's an essential micronutrient. So this is the first graphic shows you the redox cycle of iron in the environment. You're all familiar with the fact that iron exists in three major forms. The most oxidized form is Fe3+, which is ferric iron. The reduced, the next reduced form is Fe2+, which is ferrous iron and Fe0 which is the elemental form. Now the elemental form is found only uh, by anthropogenic means. You have to smelt the ores to create elemental iron. What is found in nature is ferric and ferrous iron. Now ferric and ferrous iron uh, can be either reduced or oxidized. It can be done bacterially or it can be done chemically. Let's take a look at something that's very interesting. Now we all know that if you have iron in your environment, assuming that you're not in any extreme environment, in the normal environment, you know that iron when it is in dissolved form will spontaneously get oxidized from Fe2 plus to Fe3 plus and Fe3 plus is highly insoluble. It precipitates. So you get these black precipitates and that is what we call rust. So if you have anything that contains iron like steel or any alloy of iron and so on, so you get this rust and precipitation of ferric iron. What is happening in acid mine drainage is very different from what we see in our normal environment. Our normal environment when iron containing material is in contact with water, the pH is 7 and under neutral pH conditions, Fe2 plus gets spontaneously oxidized to Fe3 plus. But acid mine drainage is a different game altogether. Here the pH is less than 2 and under these low pH conditions Fe2 does not get spontaneously oxidized to Fe3 plus. It is highly soluble and it remains soluble. It does not get oxidized. For that oxidation to happen, you need a bacterial species which is an acidophilic species and that is what is done in the environment. So here is an example of this particular iron oxidizing 
species Thiobacillus ferooxidans. This is a very neat experiment that shows you how, um, how iron is being converted under neutral conditions from ferrous iron to ferric iron. So under neutral pH, whether the sample has bacteria or no bacteria, there is spontaneous oxidation to Fe3+. In acid, uh, acidic conditions, no bacteria, there is no change. Ferrous iron remains stable. No spontaneous oxidation happens. Only when this particular bacteria, Thiobacillus, is present, it can convert ferrous iron to ferric iron. And this is, like I said, an indicator. This is again extremophilic conditions. This bacteria is again an extremophile because it's capable of living under extremely low pH conditions. So pyrite in coal can be oxidized by sulfur and iron oxidizing bacteria. So this is a coal seam and uh, you can see the gold colored discs. Some of you may be knowing that pyrite is called fool's gold. So we have FES2 and because it has a gold or shiny color, sometimes it looks shiny, sometimes it looks golden colored. So many times people who don't know better often mistake it for gold, but it's really pyrite, FES2. That's why it used to be called fool's gold. So here is an experiment that uh, what I showed you was the natural environment, but this is another experiment to show you the same thing. So you have acid mine drainage, which has very low pH and the spontaneous uh, oxidation happens only at neutral pH, not at um, low pH conditions. So you can see the precipitation of iron. So all this colored is because of the precipitation of iron. Otherwise, it's soluble and it just keeps going into the water. So the electron, now how does this work? This is an aerobic autotrophic reaction. So we have the electron donor which is Fe2 to Fe3 plus and the electron acceptor is oxygen. So you require aerobic conditions and iron for this reaction to happen. Let's come to another metal and that is mercury. Um, now you might say that mercury is not a nutrient. That is true. Mercury is extremely toxic. It is one of the most, or yes, it's, there are five toxic metals that are uh, considered to have no beneficial properties and mercury is definitely one of them. So I'll just list the toxic heavy metals. So these are considered the five toxic heavy metals which have no beneficial properties. Okay, so we'll go through the cycle for uh, mercury. So uh, looking at uh, mercury and some of the other uh, toxic heavy metals, let's just focus on mercury. It has been studied to a much greater extent perhaps than the other metals. Um, in natural conditions, the background environmental concentration of mercury is very low. So it's in PPT levels. PPT stands for parts per trillion. So it's an industrial product, we know that, and it's often used in pesticides. It has a tendency to bioaccumulate. It's also known to be extremely toxic. Like I said, it has no beneficial properties and it's extremely uh, toxic. It's a neurotoxin. Now, elemental mercury is predominant in the atmosphere and if you're wondering why, it comes, be, um, it comes from thermal power plants which burn coal. So, coal is something that contains a large number of heavy metals and when it's burned, um, all these heavy metals will rise with the hot gases and mercury has a very low boiling point compared to all the other heavy metals. So because it's 
uh, because the boiling point of mercury is much lower, it rises along with the flue gases, it goes into the atmosphere, it's a volatile compound at the temperature of the flue gases and um, it's emitted into the atmosphere. So that is the reason why elemental mercury is predominant in the atmosphere. The other thing that it has a tendency to do is it tends to, um, as the flue gases are cooling down, when they go into the atmosphere, the flue gases start cooling down and this volatile or gaseous form of mercury starts absorbing to the particles. So when these particles come down by wet and dry deposition, that's how mercury comes back on land or water. In the atmosphere, it can also get oxidized to mercury 2 plus and that's a photodegradation or uh, not photodegradation, photochemical reaction. Another uh, possible reaction is methylation of mercury. Now we know that in aquatic environments, if you have mercury 2 plus, Hg2 plus, it is quite likely to form what are called um, organic uh, organometal complexes. Yes, organometal complexes. So mercury will tie up with methyl groups and form methylated mercury. Now methylated mercury has much higher solubility compared to elemental mercury. Elemental mercury has very poor solubility. In fact, uh, often when kids end up ingesting the mercury in thermometers and so on, it gets excreted out of the digestive system because it's not very soluble. Methylated mercury, which can be present in um, fish tissue, it can be present in other foods. In fact, if you have heard about the Minamata disaster or the Minamata disease, that is because of the presence of methylated mercury in the tissue of fish. And um, I can go on and on about that. But um, uh, just remember that in Minamata, where there was a fertilizer corporation that was operating, they were uh, releasing a large amount of wastewater and the catalyst in the fertilizer production process was a mercury compound. So this wastewater had high amounts of mercury in it and when it was released into the aquatic environment, it got into the fish in methylated form. So this methylated form of mercury was being ingested by people who were eating the fish in this area. So Minamata was a village on the coast of Japan where the fishermen and their families were using this fish and uh, over a period of time they developed neurological problems and it was not just the human beings but the cats, the birds, the fish, everything was behaving in a um, not sane fashion and therefore uh, that's when people started realizing that the methylated form of mercury is a neurotoxin and uh, it is um, it's highly uh, problematic, it's highly toxic, it can be fatal. Uh, so this methylation is also mediated by microorganisms and I can give you another example of in previous experiments that I myself was part of, we used mercury chloride as a biocide to prevent microbial activity but uh, now it's well known that certain microorganisms have the ability to convert Hg2+, which is HgCl2 in dissolved form, will give you Hg2+. Now this Hg2+, can be methylated and form organic methyl. So this methyl mercury is 100 times more toxic than the inorganic form. So whether it's elemental or Hg2+, they're not as toxic as the methylated form. So here we have the biogeochemical cycling of mercury. So what is released into the air is mostly elemental mercury. It gets photochemically converted to Hg2+. Hg2 plus will absorb to particles in air, in water. It will come down through the water, through the sediment, through the air, wet and dry deposition. All this will bring it down. It will come into the sediment and there it will form complexes with both organic as well as inorganic compounds. So you get methylation of mercury as well as mercury sulfide. And like I said, it's the methylated form of mercury that is dangerous. 
let's come to the last part of this lecture and that is the industrial application of um, our understanding of how you can use certain bacterial reactions, certain biochemical reactions and chemical reactions to cycle and recover certain types of metals. So here is an example of how copper can be recovered from the ore form. So here we have the same bacterium, thiobacillus ferrooxidans, where the leaching of copper from a mineral, covalite, has been shown. So if you have bacteria, this particular bacterium, when it was added to the solution containing this mineral, you can see the amount of soluble copper released as compared to the sterile form. So this mineral without any bacteria will not release copper in soluble form. So this is one example and I will show you the next one which is far more interesting. So you know that most of the metals in their natural form are very very minor fractions of the total amount that is uh, total amount of ore containing that metal and so on. So it takes a lot of effort to take the ore out of the uh, ground and then extract the useful metal from it. So here you have low grade copper ore which is piled up in such a way that you have, you have a huge amount of surface area and this has been crushed. So you can see the crushing of the ore, it has been crushed into smaller parts to provide larger surface area and then acidic water. Acid, acidic leach water is spread. You can see the spreading, the spraying of acidic leach water over the ore. So the acid will dissolve the ore and this effluent, this is the effluent that you see coming out of the leach, um, leaching dump and this acidic water is slowly coming out and the green color is because of the soluble copper in it and the effluent in um, like I said, it's rich in dissolved copper and here in the last case, it is uh, being passed, this water is being passed over metallic iron. So these are large flumes, these are flumes with metallic iron and the copper is being passed over it. At the end of the uh, process, you get a huge pile of copper metal and I'll show you how this works. So let's start with the sprinkling of acidic water or leach liquor on the copper ore. So at this point, hydro, um, sulfuric acid is part of the leach liquor and it has been sprayed all over the copper ore. Three types of major reactions are happening at this point. The first reaction is a bacterially mediated reaction. The second one is both biological as well as chemical and the last one is a chemical reaction. So the copper in the ore is associated with sulfur. So you have Cu2S, Cus that are present. The first one under aerobic conditions, Cu2S is being converted to Cus and copper 2 plus. Copper 2 plus is soluble. So that's why the uh, effluent from the spraying of this leach liquor is going to give you uh, an effluent that is highly rich in copper. So this copper is then either converted chemically with the catalysis of Fe3 plus. So here you have a have an oxidation reduction reaction. So you have CuS in the presence of ferric iron. Ferric iron is being reduced to Fe2 plus and CuS is dissolving as Cu2+. So you get more dissolution of copper from the ore. Now this Cu2+, has to be recovered in elemental form. So how to do that? So again you have another oxidation reduction reaction where elemental iron from steel cans, so this is what you see over here, these are the metal filings, iron metal filings from steel cans or any other source. So Fe0, elemental iron along with the soluble form of copper which is there in the effluent is now being by redox reaction is being converted to elemental copper and Fe2+. At the end of this process you get this copper. Okay, 
and the next step is you have to convert Fe2+, which is the product of this reaction, has to be converted back to Fe3+. Okay, so this Fe2+, in the presence of oxygen, will go back to Fe3+, under acidic conditions, by the same bacteria, thiobacillus ferrooxidans and leptospirulum ferrooxidans. So that's in an oxidation pond. So you have complete cycling of iron and extraction of copper based on these principles. This can be done, microbial leaching can be done for uranium as well as gold. Remember that in nature, the concentrations of uranium and gold in the ore form is very, very small. So a, a huge amounts of ore have to be processed before you can extract these metals. So uranium U4 plus to U6 plus can be extracted with oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor using microbes or with iron 2, uh, uh, I'm sorry, iron 3 plus as the terminal electron acceptor. Gold in general is associated with arsenic and pyrite in nature and bacterial re leaching of gold where arsenopyrite is solubilized by bacteria will result in the release of gold and oxidation of sulfur. Gold is often complexed with cyanide and you get 95% recovery of gold from the ore. Um, at the end of this course, I would like to thank all the people who have contributed to um, making it happen. Um, at the outset, I would like to dedicate this part of the course, which means the environmental microbiology part, uh, to my PhD advisor, Professor Edward Bauer uh, of the Johns Hopkins University in the US. This part of the course is based to a very large extent on his lectures on engineering microbiology. Uh, Professor Tarashankar Pal, who has recently retired from the Department of Chemistry, and Professor Devashish Sen Gupta from Geology and Geophysics, have also been very supportive in uh, completing this course, in making this course happen, and in uh, completing, uh, helping us to complete this course. Uh, we would not have been able to put this whole thing together without the contributions of our teaching assistants. Uh, environmental chemistry, uh, our students, uh, Professor Anjali Pal's students, Ankush Majumdar, Shubhajit Piswas, Utpal Ghosh and Ashish Nayak have contributed in a big way. Uh, in environmental microbiology, my research scholars, my PhD students, Anuja Joseph, Nasiba Parveen, Ved Prakash Ranjan, Devlina Datta and Bishwatma Biswas, they have all been uh, extremely helpful in preparing the slides and the graphics and in um, putting together assignments and so many other things for this course. And finally, we would like to end it by thanking the ETEL team of IIT Kharagpur for their help and support in putting the whole thing together. So we have uh, Shiv Shankar Das, Saurabh Sahu, Sagarika Barik, Rajiv Mahapatra and Uttam Sharma. Uh, who are part of the NPTEL team over here. Thank you very much for helping us and um, putting the whole thing together. All right. Thank you. I will end this topic over here. Thank you.